Today we'll be reading from the scriptures in Luke chapter 20, verse 45 through chapter 21, verse 4. And in the hearing of all the people, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. Then he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of poverty, put in all she had to live on. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thank you, Conrad. We are in Luke chapter 20 and 21. Luke 20, verse 45 through 21, verse 4. This is one of those places in your Bible where the chapter placement is unfortunate. Um, You might wonder, how did the chapters end up where where they are? And the legend says that the guy who is putting the chapter and verses in the Bible, because that was later, right, to make it easier to find, he was doing so on horseback. And that's why we have some unfortunate uh, placements. also want to make you aware, because there's a relatively brief section of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, and there's an inverse relationship between the le- length of the text and the length of the sermon. So buckle in. In protest to daylight savings time, I will preach to when the church should have been over. <laughs> so I hope you brought comfortable clothes to wear, whatever. The honor of Jesus kingdom, the honor of Jesus' kingdom. What's really great about this passage that we're looking at is it serves as a contrast, and it's very easy just in the reading of it to recognize there's a contrast between the scribes as described by Jesus and then this widow. And what's great about having contrast in Scripture is because it makes it relatively straightforward to understand the message Jesus is trying to convey. Now, the message is relatively straightforward. Whether or not we want to hear it becomes the whole other issue, but We're going to be looking at the contrast between the scribes and this widow that Jesus describes in the temple. And what we're contrasting is the means by which, or the way in which, the individual experiences honor. How do we experience honor? And specifically, we're going to be thinking in in terms of the kingdom of Jesus, because he's the one describing these things. So we, we want to wonder, what is honor like? in Jesus' kingdom, the honor of Jesus' kingdom. And we're going to look at the scribes as a kind of an understanding of the way honor doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Then we'll look at the widow and understand a little bit about how honor does work in the kingdom of God. So the first thing, verses 45, 46, and 47 of chapter 20, the honor of Jesus' kingdom is not like the honor of the world. The honor of Jesus' kingdom is not like the honor of the world. And we we can understand this a little bit. Have you heard of a participation trophy? And we mock this a little bit, don't we? Why do we mock participation trophies? Well, because the world is competitive. Have you noticed? What's the best way to be guaranteed you will have a job? It's not the only way, but it's the best way, and it's also not a guarantee. What's the best way to be guaranteed you can have the job you want? Be better at it than anyone else. Now, that's not a guarantee. Sometimes people know people, and sometimes there's bias involved. But if you want to have a job, one of the best ways to do that is be better at it than anyone else. The world is competitive, isn't it? The world is a place of competition. The world works in competition. And so we might assume that the kingdom of heaven is a competition. This will just ruin your whole day, but here you go. Heaven, the experience of heaven, 
is one gigantic participation trophy. You did nothing but participate. The person who actually won the thing was not you, it was somebody else. And he says, here you go, here's a little trophy for playing along. You did your best, little camper. The honor of Jesus' kingdom is not like the honor of the world. And the reason I bring up participation trophy is because we tend to sneer at these scribes. But we have to recognize the way these scribes are functioning is what we call everyday living. That's just living in the world we know. And so if we're going to allow Jesus' contrast to really challenge how we see things, we need to recognize the scribes here aren't merely the bad guys or the foil. The scribes stand in and represent the way the human heart works. And if we're going to allow Jesus' contrast to actually do something in our heart, we need to know this. Jesus here issues a warning. Beware of how the scribes operate. It is normal. It is normal in the world we live in to esteem wealth, to esteem power and reputation and influence, and to esteem these things regardless of the character of the individual. That's the normal way people operate. Kingdom people, though, Jesus is going to say, don't esteem wrongly. We don't pursue empty honor. So let's look at what Jesus has to say. Verse 45, in the hearing of all the people, Jesus said to his disciples, he's speaking to his disciples, but others were, were overhearing this. Verse 46, beware of the scribes. So the first thing we need to point out about Jesus' uh, discussion here of the scribes He's not, he didn't say beware of acting like the scribes. The warning is beware of the scribes. It's a warning about a certain kind of person that could do harm to the individual. And Jesus says, beware of the scribes. This is a warning. Now, he infers, if he has to warn you about them, that you shouldn't be like them. But that's not his primary command. He says, watch out for the scribes. Beware of them. Avoiding them is the main point. When you see scribey kind of people, these are not the people, kind of people that are going to bring benefit to your life in, in the Lord. Why would he have to warn people to beware of the scribes? Because normally you wouldn't. You would be distinctly honored if a scribe showed up. If a, if a scribe were to recognize you, if a scribe were to give a tip of the hat or offer you his spot in line, of course, that would never happen. You would be distinctly honored. Oh, he, he noticed me. He recognized me. This is an important individual. If you had an event in your family home and you had invited the community and the scribe showed up to your event, you would email your friends or post on Facebook. A scribe showed up to my kid's birthday party. He never shows up for anybody's kids. This would be someone you would esteem, that you would, you would honor, you would, you would gladly associate with because of their standing, because of their, their place. And this is why Jesus has to warn them. So when Jesus says this, beware of the scribes, most people would have gone, wait, what? What are you talking about? You don't beware the scribes. You invite the scribes and hope they show up, but they're not going to because they're way more important than I'll ever be. And Jesus wants people to recognize, no, don't esteem the scribes. And he's going to explain why this is. And the primary reason is the scribes in a religious context were pursuing honor and trying to indicate that they had honor of the kingdom of God, but they pursued their honor the same way everybody else in the world pursued their honor, which is through wealth, status, influence, being important, being famous, being somebody that matters. And Jesus says, we don't esteem scribes or people like them. Look at some of the ways the scribes are described. They like to walk around in long robes. That's fine. We prefer these guys to have long robes versus short robes. That's just me. I mean, I'm just saying. But what these were is these were ornamental robes that were designed to communicate uh, influence. It's designed to communicate that you have accomplished uh, something. Um, this is the, my kid is an honor student bumper sticker form of wardrobe. It's a way to let people know 
I matter because I have achieved this particular garment. These garments would be given out based on their status. They love greetings in the marketplaces. This is a recognition. They want When they walk into a marketplace, they want people to recognize somebody important has showed up. Don't you know who I am? That would be their refrain. I should, they wanted particular seats. If they went to a restaurant, they wouldn't want the table right next to the door into the kitchen. And they would put up a stink if they didn't have the important table in the middle of the room that everybody could see that they are, that they are there. They want the most important places, not only in social gatherings, but also in religious gatherings, the synagogue. These people want to receive honor from people and achieve honor and for it to be recognized by everybody around them. And Jesus is saying, don't esteem these kinds of people. These kinds of people are not to be esteemed. Why would people honor people such as this? When I'm making these descriptions, you and your... You might be thinking about this. Well, I would never esteem people like this. These people already annoy me. But that's not the case. We esteem that which we aspire to. So you say, well, I'm not like that. Right? And I know you're arguing with me because you always do. I know how you are. There's a famous show. It was about a bar. So probably none of you have seen it. It was called Cheers. Anybody heard of this? And uh, it had a theme song. And what was the key phrase in the theme song? Where everyone knows my name. Why, why do we love that? Because we want people to know who we are. You so, say, well, I'm not like the scribe. Then why do we want people to know who we are? So Norm walks in. What does everybody do? Norm! So why does Norm matter? I know it's a fictional show. I understand it's not real. But why does Norm matter? Because when he walks into the room, there's relational connection and others recognize Norm. So therefore, Norm has significance. That's a normal thing people want. We enjoy walking into a room and have people recognize us. And when we have to walk into a room where we don't know if we're going to be recognized, it makes us uncomfortable. If you ever visited a new church, you know what that's like. You know, I'm not going to know anybody. I don't know I'm, if I'm going to sit in somebody's chair and they're going to ask me to move. You know, that yeah, it happens, I know. I don't understand it either. And so this is, we like to be recognized. This is a normal thing. The scribes like this too. They wanted people to recognize them. And this is what we all want to have identity where others recognize us for who we are and why we matter. And so we esteem that which we aspire to. We want to matter because other people recognize us. So when we see somebody who is recognizable, we esteem them. Even if their recognizableness was achieved in inappropriate ways. And that's the truth of the scribe. And so we honor what we aspire to. We want to have the trappings of success. Certainly we don't want to rub it in people's faces, but we would like people to recognize we're good at what we do. We don't mind if people recognize us for what we've accomplished. It doesn't bother us, and in fact, it sort of makes us feel good. It doesn't bother us if we're able to get the good reservation at the restaurant because of our place in the community. That doesn't bother us. In, in many ways, there's nothing wrong with that, but the scribes, this is how they built their importance. And they wanted everybody in the world around them to recognize that they are important. And Jesus is telling the people that are listening to him, his disciples, you need to avoid these kinds of people. People who obtain their identity through the trappings of success and their influence and their fame and having recognizability, these are not people who will benefit your relationship to God or his kingdom. None of these things are evil, but all of these things are small things, really, really small things, relative to the kingdom. There's a dark underbelly to the scribe's life. Look at verse 47. These same scribes devour widows' houses for pretense and make, uh, devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long 
prayers. I think these are, are two funny examples, aren't they? On the one hand, they devour a widow's house. That sounds terrible. They devour widow's houses. They also make long prayers. Oh, that's worse. I mean, it's funny. We, these are two really, really interesting examples. I would have started with the prayers one and then finished, strong finish. So how were they devouring widow's houses? He doesn't specifically tell us. We're not exactly sure how they were devouring widows' houses, there are a couple of ways they could have accomplished this. Number one, they could have accepted in pledge from families money that was intended to care for parents. So a son would say to his local religious leader, I've set aside some money to care for my mom. And the scribe would say, well, that's nice, but don't you think that money would be better used to serve the kingdom of God? And that money would then be given over to and dedicated to the scribe. And then the widow would be left without aid. And this goes completely against, of course, the Old Testament law, as well as the teaching of Christ and his apostles, where caring for those who have need is of primary importance. Another thing they might have done is they might have uh, convinced those who had limited resources that they ought to devote their resources to uh, the scribe for religious purposes. This is the modern day uh, snake oil religious salesperson who is seeking to sell access to the kingdom of heaven by convincing people to give up that which they need. So there might have been a number of ways that they were doing this. Long story short, what they were doing is they were using their position of influence to remove from those who had the greatest need their, their assistance and spend it on themselves. And this was the dark underbelly. So who paid for those long robes? And who paid for those choice seats at the restaurants? And, and who paid that the, he might have access to people of influence and political power? It's clear it came from taking advantage of those who were most exposed. So there's two elements of their the dark underbelly of these scribes. Number one, they cared very little for those who were in need. Secondly, they cared very little for an actual relationship with God. That's the way he talks about their prayer. For pretense, they make long prayers. Do long prayers convince God to do things your way? No. You want to read some of the longest prayers in the Bible? Read Job. Job talks to God for like 40 chapters, it seems. Everybody, have you read that book? Oh, my goodness. It never ends. It's a long book. And at the end of the book, what's God's answer? Gird your loins like a man. I'm going to talk to you, Job. So long prayers are not the means by which we have influence before God because the audience for these scribes was not God. When they were praying, their audience wasn't the Lord. When they're praying, their audience is their hearer. So the honor of Jesus' kingdom is not like these scribes. These scribes are pursuing honor the same way the world does, by taking advantage of those around them by trying to, to have honor, by ha being recognized through their, their trappings of success, by establishing themselves as religious authorities, even though they had no apparent relationship with God. So this is what Jesus says. They will receive the greater condemnation. You don't want to hitch your wagon to the scribes because guess where they're going? Condemnation. That's where they're going. The honor of these scribes is just like the honor of the world, and Jesus says, beware of it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. This is a familiar <clears throat> couple of verses. I'm going to read verse 33 and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What are the these things? It comes from chapter verses 31 and 32. The food you need, the clothes you need, the housing you need. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The kingdom view, not the worldly view of honor, but the, the kingdom view, the Jesus kingdom view is intended to have our minds keep things in their proper place. The problem is not the honor or the trappings of success or the long robes or the the good spots at the restaurants. The problem is the esteeming of the heart. 
That was what Jesus is getting at. The, the scribes, as well as their followers, aspired to and, es- and esteemed those who had achieved honor and importance through the means of the world. Wealth, success, status equals honor. But wealth, su- success, and status are not an indicator of character, are they? They aren't. They aren't a negative or a positive indicator. They are a neutral. Character is a whole other thing. So what Jesus is going to call us to do is esteem Jesus' kind of character. That's what we should esteem to. But the normal way our heart works is we esteem and we look up to those who have achieved. And Jesus said, no, 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 esteem something different in the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. And if you want to seek first the kingdom of God, your heart will esteem, look up to, and aspire to character that is defined by the person of Jesus himself. He said, well, what does that look like? And thankfully, Jesus proceeds to show us what that kind of character looks like in the second part of this passage, beginning in chapter 21, verse 1. The honor of Jesus' kingdom... Number one, is not like the honor of the world. Secondly, is bestowed on those who live a life of faith. The honor of Jesus' kingdom is not like the kingdom of the honor of the world. The honor of Jesus' kingdom is bestowed on those who live a life of faith. There was another famous guy. Again, I know that he's not real. I mean, the actor was real, but the character wasn't. Mr. Miyagi. You guys familiar with Mr. Miyagi? He was training a young man named Daniel. And Daniel went to him because he kept getting beat up by the guys of Cobra Kai. So he started training him. Do you remember the training regimen? Wax the car. Wax on, wax off. Sand the deck. Paint the fence. Paint the house. Remember all this? And what was Daniel's response to Mr. Miyagi's training regimen? He got a little frustrated. Now, Daniel was a little hot-headed to begin with. You know, we all see that, but I know he's not real. You're looking at me like he's real. He was real for me, okay? Very important character in my life. So what happened? He, get, he get, doesn't get really upset with Mr. Miyagi. But at the end of the movie, when, when Daniel defeats Cobra Kai... And all the, all the dudes who saw that shed a tear, you know you did. Until you don't cry in movies. You cried when Daniel's son kicked that guy in the face. If not, you stood up in the theater. Like, we did it. All of a sudden, though, that training, which made no sense, wax on, wax off. What are you talking about, Mr. Miyagi? What are you talking about? Now all of a sudden, oh, I see what's going on here. There's something else going on here that I that I hadn't seen before. And what Jesus is going to celebrate in this widow is her actions which reveal faith. Her actions which reveal the faith of her, of her heart. And this these actions are especially powerful because this woman conducts actions, she behaves in a way that reveals her faith and her behavior appears to be completely meaningless, useless, we might even say. The only reason her actions matter is because her action reveal her faith and requires great faith. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gift into the offering boxes. There were several offering boxes around the temple, and they they were boxes, and then they had a metal sort of funnel, and you would throw it in there and allow the money to be easily placed in the box, but it made it very, very difficult to get the money out of the box. It's kind of a security measure, but also it allowed you to make a little bit of racket when you put your money into it. So you, you don't want to throw paper money into the offering box. That makes no noise. You want to make some racket. It's like a, it sounds like a casino, probably. Not that I would know what that sounds like. Ridiculous. So he saw the people, and he saw a poor widow. Interesting. What did, the, what did the scribes do to widows? They devoured the houses. Now, it's not said here in the passage, but you just sort of wonder, and you ought to wonder if you're reading your Bible with an active mind, why did she only have two coins? We just talked about people who devour widows' houses. You just sort of have to wonder, 
is this a widow who had her house devoured? And now all she's got is two coins. She put two small copper coins into the offering box. How did Jesus know she put these two copper coins? Number one, he's Jesus. He might have just known. Also, he might have seen it, or he might have heard it. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, the poor widow has put in more than all of them, for she contributed, or they contributed out of their abundance. She, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The woman is not pursuing honor in the temple the way the scribes are. Why is the woman not pursuing honor the way the scribes are? She can't afford it. There is nothing she is doing in this moment that will gain her any honor the way the scribes achieved their honor. In fact, her behavior, if anything, will bring her dishonor, won't it? She showed up with two copper coins. I mean, really? Maybe you want to save up a little bit so you can get like six copper coins. But she shows up with two copper coins. She's not pursuing honor. There is no honor to be gained by her action. The only thing she is doing in this moment, because it is the only thing that makes sense, is she has come to worship. She has come to make contribution to the temple, and understanding how her Bible reads, she knows as a, a member of the people of Israel to go to the temple and participate through offering is one of the ways you worship God. Her actions, recognizing who God is by faith, reveals her faith. So her actions didn't generate faith. Her actions were the evidence of faith that was already there. Where does her hope lie? In the kingdom of God. If her hope lied elsewhere, she would have retained her two copper coins. I don't know what two copper coins would have got for her. Wouldn't have got her much. But it reveals where her hope is. Her hope is in the kingdom of God. So one of the things we notice about honor is this. Honor, where you're pursuing your honor, is defined by who your audience is. So if your audience is others, you're doing scribey kind of honor. If your audience is the Lord alone, you're pursuing kingdom kind of honor. Does that make sense? Where you're pursuing honor is determined by who you believe your audience is. This woman's audience is the Lord himself. Because he is the only one who's going to care about her two little coins. Look how Jesus describes her offering. It's interesting how he describes it. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. How did Jesus describe her gift? Quantitatively. Isn't it interesting? This is where some of you who are accountants or bookkeepers are going, okay, Jesus, you are really good at a lot of things. Accounting is not one of them. Because as soon as you say more, that's a quantitative element. This is not hard. Two copper coins, which are likely worth, le- worth less than our modern penny. Do, people, do we still use pennies? Okay. Don't they cost more to make? understand anyway i've just mentioned the third thing i don't like i don't like pennies why we still got pennies anyway what was i saying two copper coins worth less than one penny but another guy next to her is putting in a denarius one day's labor one day's wage another guy next to her is putting in a talent listen i don't have to be a math major to know this two copper coins is way less than a denarius and way 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 less than a talent. But Jesus evaluates her offering as quantitatively more. Jesus is not being condescending. He's not showing her pity. He is saying he recognizes value. He is not redefining value as less equals more. What he is saying, how does Jesus assess the value of the action? How does Jesus evaluate the the value of an action if he is saying two copper coins or more this is how jesus evaluates what something is worth the faith required to do it there's the evaluation that because that's what he says 
she, uh, contri- they contributed out of their abundance. She, out of her poverty, all she had to live on. Her hope is in the Lord and in his kingdom. So the faith required is the fundamental element of the value that Jesus is, fi- is aspiring to. So we have to understand, where was she achieving her honor? Her honor is coming by doing something for the Lord alone because she trusts the Lord. She is not buying God's favor with her gifts, right? Would somebody buy your favor by giving you a penny? No. So do you think you could buy God's favor with a penny? No, she knows she's not buying God's favor. She is trusting the Lord as an act of worship. This is kingdom kind of honor. Her honor doesn't come from what her gift would produce. What is her gift going to produce for the temple now that she's given two coins? Nothing. It is likely going to cost the temple people more to process her gift than the gift itself. They have to collect it. They have to put it in some kind of deposit. Then they have to convert it into something usable. So these two little coins are are going to cost them more to process than the gift itself. It it generates nothing. This is a lot of times we think about how we contribute with our time and effort. Is is it produced something honorable? It's really important to us. What will this accomplish? And her gift shows us what Jesus values is the faith required, not what it's going to accomplish. Her honor is from Christ himself. This is what's funny about this. Do you think she knew Jesus was watching? We have no indication Jesus ever went and talked to her. We have no indication that Jesus ever let her know that he was there. She went in, and she threw in her two little copper coins, apparently completely unknown to her. Off in the distance, there's Jesus just watching her. It's just an interesting contrast if you can see these two people in the same time in the temple. You've got this woman throwing these coins. Nobody cares. In fact, some may be annoyed. And who's watching? Jesus. And he is doing just like we did at the end of the Karate Kid. Yes! Then over here, just a few yards away, there's a group of scribes. And they got a big gaggle of people around them. And they're just fawning over them, asking them important Bible questions and all these very, very important things. And and currying favor with the people. So you've got these two people, both are receiving an honor of sorts. One of them is receiving honor that matters, and it's the widow, because she did it, and her Lord saw it. Her honor comes from Christ because she allowed what she believed about the kingdom of God to direct how she acted. She believed a certain way about how God works with his people, how he cares for his people, And that directed her steps that she would choose that in an act of faith, give all she had to live on. Now, did the scribes act in accordance with what they believed? Absolutely. You always act in accordance to what you believe. The scribes believed what matters is the honor they received from people around them. They took... They, their faith was what matters is the trappings of success and people recognizing us. And so they take steps to behave in accordance with what they believe. The principle here is what we do reveals what we believe. Why do we sin? No, you don't want to admit you sin. Some of you are going, well, I stumbled into it. Stop it. Stumbled into it. You put it on your calendar. Saved up for it. Why do we sin? We believe it will make us happy. If you believe sin would make you miserable, guess what? You wouldn't do it. This is why you don't go to the doctor for your annual physical. You believe he will make you miserable. Guess what? You're absolutely right. But it has benefits. Some of us figured out after a while, wait, it's miserable to go in because they are looking for ways to to stick you with sharp things. But the benefits outweigh the things. So why do we sin? We believe it will make us happy. Whatever your pet sin is, the the reason you do it is you think it will make you happy. And then after uh, you've sinned, you say, oh, wait, that makes me miserable. I'll never do that again. Until a little bit later on, well, no, maybe this time will be different. That's why we sin. We So why would we worship? 
Well, because I'm supposed to. Well, that's a start. Why do we worship? Because we believe God is all that matters. That's what this widow shows us. That's what worship is. We, we act in accordance to what we believe. What do you believe real honor looks like? The scribes believe honor looks like trappings of success, people recognizing them, pe- being fond over, having everything they want or need. What does Jesus say real honor looks like? The cross. That's honor. Foot washing. That's honor. Serving the lowest, that's honor. Everything in the kingdom of God is upside down from the world. And this is what Jesus wants us to see in contrasting these scribes and the woman. This widow understood what honor is because she pursued it. She wanted honor in the kingdom of God. And guess what? She got it. Honor that lasts forever. Jesus' crucifixion serves for us to show what the values of the kingdom of God is. Humiliating service to others on behalf, and, uh, on behalf of and for others because Jesus' crucifixion was for us. He died for us so our sin would be atoned for, that when we trust him, we're made righteous, and so therefore we live for the kingdom of God. So do we want to live for the kingdom of God? The answer is yes. So therefore we pursue honor the way Jesus did. What did, how did Jesus describe that? Take up your cross daily. We were hoping for it every month or two. Take up your cross daily and follow me. To pursue honor in the kingdom of God, as one writer has said, is to perfor- pursue a life that is cruciform, shaped like a cross. That's what we see in this widow. We are desperately hoping we can pursue honor for the kingdom of God the way the scribes do. That's, and that's normal. That's not messed up or weird. That means you're a person. The, the gospel, though, comes in and changes our heart and says, no, let's pursue honor the way our Savior does. And it's shaped like a cross, pursuing honor through serving others. The honor of Jesus' kingdom is not like the honor of the world. It is bestowed on those who live a life of faith. Isaiah chapter 10, we'll end with this. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 15. Shall the axe boast over him who hews with it? Hews. There's a word I don't use often. Or the saw magnify itself against him who wields it? As if a rod should wield him who lifts it. Or as if a staff should lift him who is not the wood. The writer here, Isaiah, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is communicating that those who are used by God should not boast as though they are God. So if God uses someone to accomplish his purposes, it makes as much sense for the person to boast as it would for the axe to boast about chopping down a tree. If your axe was boasting to you about how it could chop down a tree, you would do what I would do. Number one, why why is my axe talking to me? Secondly, why am I chopping a tree down with an axe? You would leave it by the tree and say, good luck with that. Well, if you're so good at chopping down a tree, I'm going to go have lunch. See how you do. So on the one hand, this passage is telling us, as tools in the hand of God, those used by God, we need to understand our place. Honor comes from God picking us up, not because we have done a thing. But this also translates into the resources and tools God has given to us. We need to keep those things that we wield in their place. Tools, resources, the stuff of this life aren't the ends. They aren't our pursuit. They aren't our goals. Do The tools, the things God has given us to use, do the work that God has called us to. They aren't the goal that God has called us to. This is where the scribes got messed up. When they looked at their uh, personal resources and their influence and their uh, uh, their, care, their, their role in the community and those things of this world that they pursued, they made those pursuits the ends instead of recognizing those things are merely things God can use for his purposes. So the things God has given us are tools in our hands. 
And we get to decide if we're going to use them for, for our use or for his. The goal is, like the widow, is we would seek to glorify God in his kingdom with the stuff that he has given us. What are some of the tools that we have been given as believers? Here's a couple of things I'll list off. Spiritual gifts. God wants to use every single person who has the Holy Spirit to accomplish kingdom purposes. Your reputation and influence. Some of us have had the joy, by God's grace, of having reputation and influence across important spheres in our community. Financial and physical resources, as we've seen in the passage. Time. Intelligence. Intellectual capability. Personality. Some of us have been gifted with personality. Others of us not. Don't judge. Ambition. You know, ambition is a gift of God. A desire to get something done. That's a, that's a gift of God. So here's, when you think of, a, of tools in your tool shed, two, tools are either used or not used. How many tools did you go buy and it, it's still just as clean and shiny as the day you, you ordered it? That happens all the time. But you got one when you need it. Or actually what you're hoping for is a buddy will call you up and say, I need one. hey, I got one of those. Then he's going to break it and you'll be mad. Tool you never used, your buddy broke and you're mad at it. Tools are either used or they are not used. When you choose to use one of these tools in your life, it's either used for ordinary purposes or it's used for kingdom purposes. Again, nothing wrong with either one of these, but this is just the categories. And what Jesus wants us to do is think about and be strategic about the stuff he has given us and say, how am I going to use the tools God has given me to pursue the greatest honor for the kingdom of God the way the widow did? Second thing. It seems simple to say, I want to trust God with the details of my life. But let me let, let you in on a little bit of a secret here. If you want to trust God in the details of your life, you will routinely find yourself in places where you wonder this. What if God doesn't come through? What if God doesn't provide as he says he will? What if God doesn't show up in the manner in which I expect him? Do you enjoy feeling like you don't know what's going to happen because you don't know what God is going to do? Do you enjoy that feeling? Most of us don't. If you do, good for you. Most of us don't like that feeling of if God doesn't show up, I'm, I'm out of luck. So we avoid feeling that way at all costs. So we live lives that require almost no faith. Because to live a life that requires faith means on a routine basis we go, but what if God doesn't show up? Or what if God shows up, but not in the way I expected him to show up? Has that ever happened? It happened when Jesus showed up. They expected a, king, a conquering king, and he shows up and dies on a cross. So one of the problems is we don't like that feeling of not knowing what's going to happen. It's unsettled. And so since we don't like that feeling, we do everything we can to avoid that feeling, and we live lives that require almost no faith. So we talked a, a while ago about habits in our Christian life. We talked about habits of reading the Bible and prayer and, and uh, pursuing the Lord through holiness. So here's a habit you might think about. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. It's not my job. And see, you're arguing with me about that too. Okay. A habit worth thinking about in your Christian life, thinking about what it looks like to form and strengthening. How do I build into my life the habit of stepping out into the unknown so that I have to trust the Lord. This isn't being foolhardy. This isn't being foolish. This is a willingness to, on purpose, go to uncomfortable places to bring glory to Jesus. Whether it be serving or volunteering, whether it be taking the initiative to pray with a coworker, whether it be the willingness to go to a neighbor and seek relational connection, even though you think he's a, a moron. Whatever, what does it mean for me on purpose to do something that takes me outside of myself a little bit so I don't know what the outcome is and I'm going to need God to, to show up? 
I'm going to need you to pray through this. What does that look like for you? What are those places where you're avoiding stretching out of yourself because you don't want to have to have that feeling of, I don't know what's going to happen? But as that woman released those two coins into that offering, did you think she was wondering that? What's going to happen? And we don't know what happened. We don't know what God decided to do in that situation. But what we do know is honorable living in the kingdom is a, is a life that says, how do I intentionally step out into a place where I have to trust the Lord? One of the ways you can diagnose this is maybe you think about your spiritual life, and maybe, not everyone, but maybe every now and then you think about your relationship with God and you think it's grown a little bit stale. This last week we went to Seaside for a conference for our association of churches, and I went to a place my family loves. It's the Seaside Candy Man, and I bought 75 pounds of saltwater taffy. And I discovered when we got home, the terrible thing to do is buy saltwater taffy in the off-season. Sorry, candy man, you did us wrong. Have you ever had stale saltwater taffy? You have to chew it for about 20 minutes to get it to the point, and now it's just too much work. It's just too much work. And some of you, that, that stale saltwater taffy is actually your life in God. It's just... Nah. And that's because we have designed a life, we have, cr we have uh, cr curated a life, we have created a system where everything's handled. And there's some wisdom in that, there's some uh, planning involved in that, and there's nothing wrong, but now we need to say, okay, now I've, I've let a muscle atrophy, what does it look like for me to step out and stretch into a place where I have to wonder, God, are you going to show up? Finally, this, let's, one last thing about the widow, the widow's giving as worship. Look at a couple of things Jesus said. Two things. Number one, the widow has put in more than everyone because of her faith, is what we suggested. Secondly, everyone else contributed out of their abundance. So Jesus is not saying it's inappropriate to contribute out of abundance. What he is saying is if you want to honor and esteem, we honor and esteem acts of worship that require great faith. He is not saying the others shouldn't have given, they shouldn't have participated. The question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to worship, not just through giving, but worship generally in our life is this. Not what can I pull off, not what can I afford, not what fits my life. The question is this, for me in this particular area, whether it be singing on Sunday morning, whether it be attending a Sunday morning or a small group, whether it be sharing the gospel with your neighbor, whether it be volunteering to serve the Lord in the church or in the community, the question is, what does worship look like? And what does worship look like does not primarily wonder what I can handle, Worship wonders what God is like. That, it's a catering our actions based on what we believe and understand to be true about God, not what we believe and understand to be true about us. We, worship questions answer, ask these kinds of questions. What would bring God delight in how I use the tools of my life, my spiritual gifts, my physical resources, the relationships in my life, the, the influence I carry? What would bring God delight in how I use these tools? The question isn't, what can I afford? What can I handle? What can I manage? This has become popular in churches. You take a personality test to decide what your spiritual gift is so you can find out where you fit, Right? So I'm reading through the book of Acts, right? Yeah, th they don't look like they fit anywhere. Here you've got Paul, a Pharisee, a, a, what some have said may have been the smartest man who ever lived. So where would you send that guy? You've got a guy who's probably memorized the Old Testament in the Hebrew. Where do you send that guy? Jerusalem. To the Jews, obviously. He speaks Hebrew. So where does God send him? 
Gentiles. That makes no sense. If Paul would have taken a personality spiritual gift test, he would have lived his whole life in Jerusalem. Thank the Lord he listened to the Holy Spirit. The question is, what does it look like in my life to bring God delight? And you can ask those about all the roles you fill in your life, as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as an employee, as an employer. What does it look like with these tools and resources God has given me to bring him delight? That's what the widow asked. And that's what honor looks like in the kingdom of God. Honor in Jesus' kingdom is not like the honor of this world, and it's bestowed on those who live by faith. God, we thank you for the privilege it is to know, know you by your word. And we thank you for how you have demonstrated so clearly what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. You demonstrated that by going to the cross for us. Father, we would pray that you would move in our hearts by your spirit to be willing to recognize those places where we have let pride and self-sufficiency build up. And we have long since stopped thinking about having our life be an act of worship through looking like the cross. God, we would pray in these moments you might open our eyes and our minds to see what does it look like for us as individuals to worship you with the things you have given us. How do we bring you delight? And God, we confess, we have, we have yearned for and desired the, the adoration of people around us, recognition. And we pray, God, that we would have an understanding of honor like Jesus did, that comes through humble service to those who don't deserve it. God, I would pray that we would recognize that you save sinners like us. I would pray for those here who don't know you, that they would see by the grace of God how much they need a saver, Savior who serves those who don't deserve it. God, we thank you for gr your grace and your kindness, and we pray that our hearts and minds would be shaped to be like our Savior Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You stand up with us as we close with a song.